All right, so we are live. So I decided this week to kind of just kind of skip the formal countdown and really just kind of get to the meat and potatoes of what's going on. Again, I am your truly Dr. Barry Pierre, favorite board certified attorney, host of Medicine Mondays, part of the Empire of Self Health series. And of course, now our episode number two of The Real Physician Reacts. This is where I, you know, I see, you know, social media posts, videos, and just things that are unfortunately either untrue, not as factual as it needs to be. And I kind of give clarification, right? Especially from the physician point of view. And, and I think it's important, right? And I think, I, honestly, I probably should have started uh, this series with an episode like this, really to kind of understand the why behind it all, right? So for all of those who caught last week's episode, first of all, thank you um, for, again, a lot of lot of views, a lot of, lot, of, lot of comments, a lot of great questions in the comments as well. And that's really most important, right? Because I want to be able to answer some questions and get, get feedback from the people who watch it, right? So again, always feel encouraged uh, to uh, leave a comment, obviously share, uh, leave reviews. And then if there's a topic or concern that you want me to touch on, or something that you come across your social media platforms, uh, feel free. Again, just follow my uh, Instagram page. Uh, that's probably the, the best way to get me. Follow me on Instagram page at Dr. Barry Pierre. Um, you know, shoot me a DM. Say, hey, I saw this. Uh, do you mind maybe touching uh, on it on during your real physician react series? Right. And again, if I could, if I could, because we can, we only do this once a week. Again, um, again, I think if again if the you know, if the, if the people want, again, if you guys want it, we could probably do it more. But again, right now we're just doing it once a week, Thursday nights, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern. So we are going to be talking about the importance of health information and really more importantly, the importance of misinformation and unfortunately disinformation and why why I'm here, what I'm doing now. Um, again, I started, I started on social media probably during medical school when I was just writing a blog. And, you know, kind of carried on, you know, I just got always enamored with social media and being able to teach and educate people that really wasn't in front of me. Right. Like I said, right now I'm, I'm in the comfort. As you can see, I'm in the comfort of my own home. But you could be across the country, across the world uh, watching this, learning this and, you know, getting valuable information. Right. Which is so important for me. But what what has you know, what came into fruition. Right. And again, I I do blame our healthcare workers, especially the physicians. Um, a little bit on this, right? Is that, you know, when when it was time to get on social media, when it was time to educate uh, the community, we weren't there, right? And everyone else was on social media, everyone else, again, social media, internet, however you want to um, parlay it, everyone else was on these, you know, you know, these platforms looking for answers. But unfortunately, there, there wasn't enough experts like me and a lot of my colleagues, um, you know, that I'm, I'm gracious to, to be around and, you know, really call my colleagues, to really kind of say like, no, this is the right information. So unfortunately, we have had this level of misinformation. And again, that did not just start now. Of course, obviously, today we'll be talking uh, about the misinformation, especially in reference to uh, the COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccine. But it's been, yeah, you know, as as early as since the decades, right? Where this is a decades long issue of misinformation that unfortunately not only harms people, continues to put harms people. Again, we have a lot of people who end up um, dying, right, from this level of misinformation, right, and and not really getting the trusted source that we are. So, again, I want to I want to share a couple of things, right, before we before we kind of get started, right, just to kind of again, just to kind of understand like where is you know the kind of the general public, right? Again, and for those who may know, not only do I have my medical degree, um, I also have a medical degree, but I also have a degree in public health. And one of those, one of the facets, and one of the things I love about public health is that it allowed me to expand my thinking. When I was, you know, again, when I'm, you know, I'm thinking about medicine, I'm thinking about diabetes, hypertension, but I'm not only focused on the patient in front of me, I'm focused on all of the other people who may be affected within the community and what community wide changes I can make, right? So it's, it's definitely been one of the things that I don't know if I'm the physician I am today without my public health degree. So shout out to all my uh, public health professionals out there because, uh, you know, especially at a time like this, um, your job is so vital. Uh, being able to process information, take the information uh, and give pro proper information out in this context, right? Because again, fortunately, uh, we're running a race where misinformation and disinformation um, is winning, right? So we kind of have to play a little bit of catch up again. So, so shout out to definitely all of my colleagues who are really taking that mantle upon themselves to say, you know what, I'm going to combat 
misinformation every chance I get. Like I said, I follow, I saw, I follow some of my colleagues on Instagram, I follow some of my colleagues on uh, Facebook, on TikTok, right? Who spend the time doing this. And again, I'm just kind of adding, you know, my little flavor as well too. So let's, let's take a look here at, you know, what our surgeon general uh, talks about when, when he references what is uh, misinformation and why it's such a growing concern, especially now in 2021, um, where COVID is unfortunately, uh, again, uh, running rough shot, um, you know, over the, the entire country. Let me see if we make sure we can get a get a good view of that. In fact, I'll let me, uh, yeah, let me uh, small my screen. Did, uh, let me see if I can. Yeah, let's make that a little bigger. So let's um let's just let's go to you know just the title, right? So I think the title says it in and of itself, right? Confronting health misinformation, right? And one thing I want people to understand, like that when I, cause I, and I'm purposely saying misinformation and disinformation. If you, right, are looking for information on COVID-19, on diabetes, on hypertension, and you go to a website that gives you what you believe to be, you know, credible information, and it turns out not to be, and then you turn around and say, like, you kind of quote like that, that information that you saw, that's what misinformation, right? You are unintentionally, you know, absorbing and, you know, learning, you know, incorrect uh, and not factual information. When we talk about disinformation, right, which is what we're seeing a lot now, right? Like, I, I, again, I know if you caught last week's episode, we talked about Dr. Dan Stock. Um, you know, there's, there's someone sent me a video, right, kind of a little bit before this, which you may have to talk about maybe next week, uh, of just disinformation, right, where you are purposely giving out, uh, you know, not factual, right? We're essentially just lies, right? You're purposely giving it out uh, for the purpose to dissuade you, right? Like that's that's disinformation, right? And that's one of the things, and that's why physicians across the world, right, have to really stand up and again, not, you know, not be content with just taking care of people kind of one-to-one, but being able to kind of, again, shove a camera in their face, say like, no, like what they're saying is not true. So he talks about confronting health misinformation, and this is by uh, the U.S. Surgeon General. And again, we're not, I will put the links uh, to everything I showed tonight um, in the description on our YouTube page. Again, make sure you're subscribed and follow uh, for that. Like I said, we do Mondays, we do our medicine Mondays, comes out at 9 a.m. And then at Thursday evenings, 9 p.m., we do our um, Real Physician Reacts, right? So I, I just want to kind of highlight um, kind of this kind of this last section here, right? Now I'm going to read it real quick just so you know. Uh, amid all this information, many people have been exposed to health misinformation, information that is false, inaccurate, or misleading according to the best available evidence. Uh, misinformation has caused confusion and led people to decline COVID-19 vaccines, reject public health measures such as masking and physical distancing and using and use unproven treatments. For example, recent studies show that even brief exposure to COVID-19 vaccine misinformation made people less likely to want a COVID-19 vaccine. Misinformation has also led to a, to the harassment of violence against public health workers, health professionals, airline staff, other frontline workers tasked with communicating uh, evolving public health measures, right? And I, I want to point that out. Like, I, I was, I'm not, we won't spend too much time on that, but I, I read, uh, read an article that talked about how a teacher, right? Like a teacher um, was physically assaulted, right? By a parent. Like, ima- imagine like that sentence, a teacher physically assaults a, a, a teacher is physically assaulted by a parent, right? Because the teacher is saying, no, you have to wear a mask to come into the school, right? Like that, that is what, that is the unfortunate consequence of misinformation, and disinformation, that someone can be so emboldened to attack the, the, the same people who are required to teach your children, to take care of your children. They're so emboldened that they say, I can attack this person uh, based on what is obviously not true, right? Like this aspect of you don't need a mask, right? So that's kind of where we got. And this is, this is 2021. Again, this isn't something I read that happened a few years ago. This is like, I think in the past two weeks. And then this last aspect here, just so just to kind of highlight that, you know, this isn't the first time in medicine we're dealing with misinformation. 
So health misinformation is not a recent phenomenon. In the late 1990s, a poorly designed study later retracted, falsely claimed that the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine causes autism. And, and for those who may not be, know or may have followed me, uh, especially if this is your first time, um, I have uh, two children um, who are autistic, right? And despite the fact that we've been able to, again, really debunk everything that was in this initial study, People still continue to quote this, the reason why they're not giving their kids vaccine. And unfortunately, what is what is the consequence of a uh, poorly designed study that turned out to be incorrect? Even after the retraction, the claim gained some traction, contributed to lower immunization rates over the next 20 years. So think about that. A, a study that was incorrect, that was retracted in the 1990s, 20 years later, we are still dealing with the effects. And mind you, we are only two years out uh, from, you know, I, I rounded up two years out from COVID-19. So just imagine, you know, that aspect of having to deal with misinformation 20 years down the line because of something you picked up. Just since uh, 2017, we have seen measles outbreaks in Washington State, Minnesota, New York City, and other areas. Health misinformation is a global problem. Again, this is the kind of point to fact that this isn't just an issue that happens here in the United States. This is worldwide. In South Africa, for example, AIDS denialism, a false belief that denying HIV causes AIDS, was adopted at the highest levels of national government, reducing access to effective treatment and contributing to more than 330,000 deaths uh, between 2000 and 2005. Health information has also reduced the willingness of people to seek effective treatment for cancer, heart disease, and other conditions, right? So again, I, and again, I will put the link uh, to the full, you know, to the full descriptor of what's going on here. But like, this is, this is what we're having to battle against, right? We're having to battle against the fact that when health, and unfortunately, misinformation and disinformation spread so fast, Right. Like I was reading one um, article and I will definitely put it in the description that you almost have to treat it like a disease. Right. You have to treat the misinformation, disinformation that's coming out like a disease that has to be contained, that has to be stopped very quickly, because if it doesn't, it spreads so rapidly. Right. We've saw it's kind of said the term before that negative news, right. Bad news spreads much faster than the good news. Right. And this and it happens, unfortunately, health information. So a lie travels much further, much faster. Right. Than any, like, again, like the video I'm doing now. Right. Yeah. Well, again, a good amount of people may see it. But if if I were and if I were saying, you know, a, a slew of lies that would travel in much further and much further circles. Right. So this is what we're having to combat as a public health professional who I am and as a physician and a frontline worker. We're having to combat all of these different obstacles in our way. But again, this is yeah, this is why we do, uh, you know, what we do. Right. So, again, I just want to uh, point that out. So let's today we are going to be highlighting. Um, a, uh, a episode I saw from Vice News. Um, again, we'll have a description and uh, we'll have a link to uh, the video in the description that focused on Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, and it talked about what health mis information, misinformation and disinformation has done just to that little small town. And I want you guys to think about, yes, this is what's happened in Little Rock, Arkansas, but this is happening like worldwide, right? Like, so this isn't just a small town you know, phenomenal small town issue. This is happening worldwide, right? So let's let's um let's, sh let's show the video, right? Like I said, obviously, just like last week, we're gonna be starting stopping whenever I see stuff that you know we need, we need, we definitely should be talking about. So yeah, let's let's uh let's go here. People were more rescuable in the first pandemic. This has a higher mortality in the younger group than the first one did. And um, I, I definitely want to point that out that I think something that people aren't really grasping that's really happening across the world is that this specific wave, depending on when you're watching this, but this specific wave of, of COVID-19, especially associated with the Delta variant, Delta variant plus depending on where you're staying, um, in a 
we're losing, right? Again, I just, I'll just say it like that. Um, when I was taking care of patients last year, uh, when the initial first wave, when we had no treatments, we didn't have a vaccine, we were just again, kind of throwing kitchen sink and everything that we can to save our patients. Those patients were doing much better, right? Than the patients we have now. We're getting a lot younger patients, we're, and again, and this will obviously make sense once we think about it, we're getting a lot younger patients. These patients are coming in much more sick uh, than they did, again, the first wave around. Um, and what you're seeing really across the country is that we're getting so many, it's overloading the systems again, like it did the first wave. And unfortunately, we aren't even as successful, right? Where I could have a patient, I may take care of you know, maybe, you know, four, six, eight weeks, and then I eventually get them out of the hospital. Uh, patients aren't lasting that long, right? Which is, you know, unfortunately, the reality that we kind of warn people could occur if you do not protect yourself in every valuable way, right? Which is with vaccine, which is with uh, masking, which is with physical distancing, right? Um, you know, trying to brush off that this vaccine, uh, this uh, disease, right, didn't exist, right? That's that's kind of why we're here now, right? So again, I want you to really kind of focus on a lot of the stuff that's said during this video. And like I said, I'll be starting to stop and to kind of give my points um, there. But like that's, I think like that first segment um, is extremely important, right? Like right now we're seeing a disease wave that the patients are sicker, the patients are younger, right? And they're dying. I did not realize that threat of death is inadequate to make people want to go have vaccines. We're here in a hospital in Little. And isn't that sad? Again, I hate to keep talking. About, trust me, I'll, I'll definitely let it run a little bit longer. But isn't it sad that the threat of death is not enough? Right? Like we said, all of the things that could happen up to and including death. And even at that point, even at that extreme of death, that was not enough to get a lot of our, um, you know, eligible population to get the vaccine, to get the vaccine and social distance and phys like that wasn't enough for them. And unfortunately, we're seeing those effects, right? We're seeing the effects of the campaigns against the vaccine, the campaigns against not only are we seeing campaigns against the vaccine, we're seeing campaigns against the virus. Like there are actually a slew of people who do not believe, right, that COVID-19 is a thing. Think about that, right? There are a slew of people who don't even believe that COVID-19 even exists, right? So like, how do you convince a person who does not even believe COVID-19 exists that they should get a vaccine for something that they don't think exists, right? It's tough. Little Rock, Arkansas, where the Delta variant has led to a surge in COVID cases. The ICU is full beyond capacity. There are people on ventilators who are in their 20s and over 90% of the patients are unvaccinated. Arkansas has one of the lowest vaccination rates in the country. Four months ago, the state legislature passed a ban on mask mandates. Now with the spread of the Delta variant. So, so think, about, think, think about that combination. You have, you have misinformation, plenty across the internet. Then you have an issue where the government, especially of that state is saying, I'm not even going to allow you to require people to mask up, right? So again, if you are, right, not in the know, like if there's, if, if your government is saying like, no, we're not even gonna allow people to require masks to come into businesses, they're essentially saying that like, no, we don't think one, this COVID-19 is that serious. And two, we don't think that it should be something that, um, you know, that should be affecting our patrons, right? Like as a, as a physician, as a public health professional, like this, this just is, is frightening, right? Like what's happening across the country. And again, I'm in the state of Florida. So trust me, I can't even talk about what's happening in Arkansas because our governor is the same, ex again, kind of lockstep and key. And it's there's a similar patterns, but again, that's not, not here or there. But that's what's happening, right? Like you having government agencies saying like, we not, not only do we not believe in the threat of COVID-19, 
we're not even going to allow businesses to require masks. Like we're saying you can't do that. Right. Like, so again, how is that the person who is watching their government do that? How do I then come in and convince them that one COVID-19 is real and two, that they should get a vaccine for something that is real. Right. It's uh, you know, very troubling. Hospitals here are being pushed to the brink. Hey, Ms. Chandler. I'm good. How are you? So I'm actually going to probably move you down to 85 and see how you do. Uh, once we're down to 60 or 70, then I'll probably decrease the flow a little bit. Okay? But I would say do get vaccinated as soon as it's time. Okay? Because that's the only way we're going to make this demon go away from our life. Okay? What are you hearing from unvaccinated patients who end up here in the ICU? Well, only a few of them would actually believe they have COVID. You have to tell them every day. Most that people this is don't COVID. even believe they have COVID. There's a fair number here. of people who don't believe they have COVID and then we are lying to them. How do you overcome that? <laughs> guys, guys, again, like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to laugh, right? I, d I don't want to laugh, but it is, it's so, it's so scary that you can be in the ICU, right? Requiring, you know, significant amount of, you know, breathing and machines and medications that are not FDA approved, right? Which again, it could be a whole nother discussion that you can be around people who have to talk to you with a N95 mask fully gowned, right? You can be around all of that and still not believe that the disease process that is affecting you is even affecting you. Right. Like again, and this is I, I love the reason why I love this video is that this is really telling what's happening across the country. Because like, again, when I, I talk to my physician colleagues, like like only us physician colleagues can even believe the stories that are happening in these ICUs. Right. Like, again, I was I was I was taking care of a couple of patients in the um, uh, acute care center uh, this past weekend. And first, I took care of 15 patients with covid. All 15 uh, were not vaccinated. Right. And when I would ask, especially the ones who could talk to me, when I would ask them, like, you know, why, like, what were you doing? Like, what was the holdup? What was the reason? Because, again, there's some people who may have valid reasons why they can't get the vaccine, allergies and whatnot. None of them had an allergy vaccine. So everyone was eligible to get it. What we but mo most of it was, I, you know, I didn't trust the information that was out there. My I, I had a, a fortunate a couple elderly patients who their kids said, we don't know what's in that vaccine. Don't take it. All right. So, of course, me, I just asked, well, do your kids know what are in these medications we're given now? Right. And of course, the answer was no. Right. Because um, when you're on the outside and don't think that something is real before it affects you, you're, you're you, it's OK to not believe anything. But once you get inside that hospital, once you get to the point where you can't breathe, all of a sudden, all stops, right? You want to make sure you get every single medication, every single steroid, and 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 it's 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 ironic because those are typically the families that are calling, making sure that hey, did my mom get this? Did my mom get that? And, and of course, I always explain, well, you know, this is not FDA approved, not FDA approved, like all of these things that they may have read somewhere, um, you know, vitamin this, vitamin that, and like it's it's just. It's just a, an unfortunate situation that we find ourselves in now during this third or fourth wave, depending on what you're counting, um, wave of COVID, right? It's an unfortunate situation. And like I said, we are not doing a good job right now. Like, again, from a health care professional, um, we are not winning this battle right now. Like it is, again, it is a, there's a lot of sad faces going on. I could probably do, I'll probably do one where I just focus on you know, what are the thoughts going on with doctors, healthcare workers, frontline workers uh, across the board just on COVID? But like, again, that's neither here nor there. So let's let's continue. Like I said, we uh, I want I want to make sure we get through the video. Denial. It's very hard to do. I mean, you educate them, but if they get too agitated, then they get more short of breath, then they require more support, and then they get intubated, which then these two a longer hospital stay. <laughs> So the hospital won't let us inside the patient's room, so we have to talk to them through the glass with this walkie-talkie. Hi, Ms. Chandler. How are you? Can you talk me through how you ended up here? 
I had come down with what I thought was just an allergy, and it progressed, and I had fever going. Seven days later, my lungs were covered in COVID pneumonia. When you cannot breathe and you can't get air, it is very scary. Did you get the vaccine? No. Have you talked to the doctors and nurses here about the vaccine? I have, and yes, they're explaining, but you have to be open to hear, and I wasn't, and I'm more open to listen now. Why did you agree to be interviewed? I'm living something I didn't believe. I'm living it, and people need to know that it is real. It is real. People are dying. They are dying. 18 months into the pandemic, doctors here say that so that right is one version of the patients that we're seeing in a hospital setting. The ones who, again, on the outside did not believe that it was real, did not believe in mass mandates, social distancing, that they didn't believe in any of that. And when they picked up the disease and they realized what they thought was this boogeyman that people were screaming was actually real, like reality hit them like a ton of bricks. And they realized that they now need to be a vocal champion to say like, no guys, this is real. We, and if you can avoid, you know, being where I'm at, cause as you can see, she's in isolation, right? Again, to talk to her, you have to be gowned up, masked up, right? Like this, again, she is, she is alone. There's no family visitors that can come in when you're COVID-19 positive, especially as ill as she appeared to be. Um, she was on a significant amount of oxygen just by the way that I can hear her oxygen tank, right? Typically, if you're on a low setting of oxygen, I can't hear your oxygen blowing. You can hear her oxygen trying to, her oxygen tank and her uh, nasal cannula trying to get air inside, right? So she was requiring a significant amount of oxygen. And if you picked it up, she couldn't even really complete her sentences, right? She always had a then complete her sentence, right? So that's what we consider conversational dyspia, right? So this is a lady who has no kind of reserve in her lungs, difficulty breathing, and again, that's kind of where she's at right now. That's one type of patient. So we're gonna, unfortunately, we're gonna kind of see the other side, which we're seeing a lot more right now. They have more COVID cases than ever, and new groups are being hit harder. 20% of this hospital's recent COVID patients have been pregnant women. Lindsay Smith didn't get the vaccine and tested positive when she came to the hospital to give birth. She's asymptomatic, but and I, I want I definitely want to point this out now, especially um, if you have if you or if you have any family members um, who may be pregnant, maybe lactating. Uh, the American College of uh, uh, Obstetrician or ACOG. Um, sorry about that butchering your last name, butchering the name. Um, they have recommended the vaccine. Right. Like they they have. And, and, and I always say, right. Yeah. Don't listen to me, the lowly internist. Right. Again, I take care of adults, but I don't do women's health like that. Um, I will put a link in the description to ACOG's recommendations on COVID vaccine. They recommend the COVID vaccine while you're pregnant, while you're get, attempting to get pregnant. Um, no, there's no concerns for infertility or anything that you may have read from a misinformation uh, related standpoint. Right. So this is a lady who was pregnant, had the opportunity, shit, and I'm, I'm almost sure um, was told to get the COVID vaccine, did not, um, and now she's here in the hospital and had to have her baby. But had to be separated from her newborn son. This is our son. He's in the NICU right now. It looks like he's sleeping. How is it to not be able to, to go and, and see your baby in person? This morning was pretty, pretty difficult because um, he's supposed to be with me, you know? <clears throat> he's been with me the whole time. And now I can't even hold him. So that's, that's definitely hard. I haven't got to meet my son yet. Does being here in this situation, not being able to, to see your baby in person make you start to reconsider at all not wanting the vaccine? No. No, because even with getting the vaccine, you can still spread it. You can still get it. So this, um, we talked about, let me, let me up, let me up my size. So we talked about this last week. Um, 
this fallacy, right, that is going on the side of people who are typically anti-vaccine, um, that it's either or, right? Either I get the vaccine and I never get COVID or I don't get the vaccine and COVID doesn't exist. And I've said this before, i say this again, um, getting the vaccine does not prevent you from getting COVID. In fact, the goal was never to prevent you from getting COVID. Getting the vaccine, the goal was to prevent you from seeing me in the hospital setting for acute disease. Like that was always the goal. And this, again, the, the narrative, again, misinformation, disinformation, that if you get the vaccine and you get COVID afterward, that means the vaccine doesn't work. That is, it's just not true, right? Like it's never been true. Um, it's never been, uh, it, again, that was never the thought process, right? And, and that's one thing I typically have to combat a lot of people who are against the vaccine, especially when they bring up that, oh, you could still get COVID. Um, one, right, it was never made to not give you COVID, right? You were never going to prevent 100% of COVID just because you got a vaccine. We knew that. Um, we It was never championed that way. It was never discovered that way. But the other side, right, the people who were anti-vaccine always made it try to attach that narrative so they could say like, oh, look, like this person got the vaccine, they still got COVID. But what is what it always gets left off, right, on during those discussions is where does the people who, um, you know, who are saying like, oh, look, that person got COVID, even though they got a vaccine, where do they think the, where do they think they're getting COVID from? Right? Like it's, if, 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 again, especially, you know, take away the Delta variant and everything, the transmission rate um, or the ability to transmit disease was so significantly lower in patients who had the vaccine that you can, again, remember with the CDC guidelines, again, those guidelines that unfortunately, um, some people read that they were talking to the whole public, but when in actuality, they were only talking to people vaccinated. The CDC guidelines at the time said, hey, if you are vaccinated and you're around other vaccinated people, you can go around maskless, right? Because they knew that the likelihood of you being able to transmit back and forth was so low because everyone was protected and vaccinated. So, but what occurred, unfortunately, is that those who are not vaccinated or just against uh, COVID-19, the theory, or against the vaccine said, oh, I'm also not going to wear my mask. I'm also going to not social distance. And then they gave, right? They gave the COVID-19 back to, or I don't want to say back to, but it gave it to or introduced it uh, to the population of those who are vaccinated, right? The Delta variant, the Delta variant plus and every other variant, the reason why that occurs is because the multiplication that occurs in the unvaccinated group. Multiplication was not occurring in the vaccinated group. It was occurring in the unvaccinated group. And unfortunately, it multiplied to a point where a variant was strong enough to pass back to those who were vaccinated, right? So I, I, I always laugh when the non-vaccinated say like, oh, see, look, they can still, they got COVID, even though they got the vaccine. Um, yeah, like that's not a problem. The issue is like, again, we have the governor in Texas just recently diagnosed uh, with COVID-19. Again, likely got it from someone who was un unvaccinated around them. Um, and he's fine, right? And not only is it fine, he even got, not only did he get the vaccine, not FDA approved yet, by December, we should be confirmed. Um, but he also got a monoclonal antibody treatment, not FDA approved yet. Again, which is something our governor here in Florida is peddling as well, too. Um, so there was a lot of not non FDA approved stuff being thrown around to prevent him from having to go into the hospital. So when you see a lot of your again, especially these governors who are making these rules to say like, oh, you can't, you know, you know, require masks. They're doing though as they send their children to schools that require masks. Because remember, it's a public school issue, right? But private schools have their own set of rules. So they're sending their kids to private schools that require masks, but telling you like the public schools can't require masks, right? Like, so that's what's happening pretty much across the country uh, in those specific areas. But again, this is again, so you can see this lady has been. Her baby has been snatched away from her because she has COVID, right? And this, the husband most likely has COVID as well, which is why he's able to chill in the room. And still, that is not enough to say, you know what? I need to protect myself, right? So when, when you're thinking, when that's the type of mindset that 
that people are walking around with, right? It's no wonder that we're dealing with a fourth wave. And, you know, when this dies down, we'll be dealing with like, there's no wonder, right? Because you have people with this type of mindset, um, you know, that are, are okay, right? With, you know, COVID doing what COVID does. There aren't, there simply aren't enough studies for it. And we all know, again, and I hate this, I hate this topic so quickly, but we all know that's not true, right? Again, this is a part of misinformation slash disinformation. We know the, the amount of studies that are out there to show not only safety protocol, not only, um, you know, across this here in the United States, but across the world. Right. And again, there's there's they're even doing follow up studies when variants like this pick up. Right. Again, still can showing that consistent um, message that if you get the vaccine, you are likely going to be much more protected than not getting the vaccines. Right. So clearly, again, she just again, I, again, it's it's one of those situations where is is she so misinformed that she now just believes it or is she purposely saying stuff that just isn't true? What are you worried about? I don't know what's in it. You hear things, you know, like it, it's changing genetics, it's changing DNA. We know that, again, both the mRNA vaccine, Moderna, Pfizer, and the viral vector vaccine, Johnson & Johnson, um, do not change DNA. Um, again, that was, again, we, we've, we've, you know, we've debunked that so often. Uh, but again, Little Rock, Arkansas, um, and which, again, for, for those who may not realize, not only has the highest number, that county has a high number of cases in that state, but it also has the highest number of deaths in that state. Uh, but even then, you know, this is the information that's out there. And things like that. I don't know how true that is, but I also don't know how true the things that they are saying, the good things about it that they say. So this is important, right? And again, like, again this, I think this is why we have to do the series that we're doing. So here you have a person who says like, hey, I heard that it changes DNA and heard they don't know what's in the medication. It's like, you know, since they're sprinkling some magic juice in there. Um, but I also heard some good things as well, but I don't know who to believe. So you have a you have a person, right? And again, she's not alone. We're not picking on her, right? Because she is like many across the country, right? Who has a thought right? And honestly, she says she doesn't know who to believe, but clearly she believes the other side, right? Clearly someone on the other side is deemed much more trustworthy uh, as far as giving that information out than the scientists and the, the health professionals and the doctors and the public health professionals like on that side, right? Like it's, so it's, she's, she's made, she's picked her side. She says that I rather go with this side over here who believes that it, that somehow this vaccine will change your DNA, who somehow believe this, I, you know, th there's mystery ingredients in said vaccine versus this side over here that's saying like, no, this is all of the stuff that is in the vaccine. No, it does not change your DNA. It never does that. It's, it's, it would be impossible to do so. Um, yet here are the safety protocols. Here are all the studies. She has chosen not to believe any of that, right? And again, and unfortunate, again, I've said this before, when these patients get sick, um, despite g living and believing everything on the other side, they still come to the hospital to get everything that medicine provides, right? Like, which is sad, right? Like it, they still come into the hospital to get all of the treatments, all of the FDA unimproved treatments, right? They want the kitchen sink. Their family wants the kitchen sink. Everyone wants everything given for them, except the vaccine that would have prevented you from seeing them in the first place. Does it frustrate you to have patients who refuse the vaccine and then end up here in the ICU? More disappointed in them because the information has been out there. Uh, it's just like what media they are using will color their perceptions and the family members and their perceptions. I didn't think I would live through a time when vaccines would be so ridiculed. Have you had sick? And, and he, <laughs> that pulmonologist writes, I mean, he hits, especially for me, hits it right on the head. I did not think we would live in a time where treatment would be so ridiculed, right? Like people talk, people say this all the time. Oh, when are they coming for the cure for cancer, the cure for HIV, the cure for this, the cure for that? Like, when are they coming for all of these cures? But when we have the technology and the technology catches up so that we can prepare, a, again, not a cure, but we can prepare a great preventative measure, people are like, eh, I'm not sure about all that. 
right? Like, and, again, and, and I never thought I would live in a time where people would be on the opposite side of a preventative measure like a vaccine. I never thought that would occur, but clearly here we are, right? And and I was I was telling a good friend of mine, Michael Swinton, um, he's a lawyer, and I was talking to him. I said, hey, like on in my hand, right? In my hand, right? You know, shout out to Apple, right? In my hand, I can make a phone call. I can send an email. I can send a text message. I can do a video call. I can send a fax. I can internationally call somebody. I can check the account balance in my bank, right? I can edit photography, edit videos. Like I can do all of these things from the palm of my hand, right? And people recognize that technology is so great that we can do all this in the palm of our hand. But for some reason, people do not think that the technology and the advancement of technology would have also translated in medicine, right? Like, and that's, I think that is probably what blows my mind more than anything else. Like, like, why do you think Apple and Samsung and all of them could have great technological advancements, but not the medical field, right? So of course, we can treat things faster. Of course, we can make treatments faster, right? Like that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to evolve. But we're here, especially at a time like this, where there's people on sides are like, oh, I don't know about that, right? Like, and 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 I'll and I'll post it in the description. You know, my my uh, my podcast episode where I talked about, you know, how we got the COVID vaccine so fast. I always put in quotation marks because it really didn't come fast. Um, it's just that technology is great right now, right? Like it just is what it is. So, so he, I mean, he hit it right on the head. I never would have thought we'd be on a time where I'd have to argue against it, but here we are. Success at convincing either patients or their family members to get vaccinated? I would say fifth of the time. A fifth of the time. Mm -hmm. And they may say yes to you here. If they actually get vaccinated is a different story. So these nurses are turning a patient over. It's called proning, and it's done to increase airflow. Healthcare workers are exhausted and frustrated. And that is probably that is probably an understatement happening right now. Like when I talk to my colleagues across the board, right? When I talk to my colleagues across the board, there is a level of I can't believe we have to go through this again, right? Let me let me big myself up so I can do my little monologue, right? I cannot believe we have to go through this again. I cannot believe that you know. And again, we we and I talked. I kind of hinted earlier because we're not do, like you know we want to be heroes, right? We're doctors, right? We're we're nurses, right? We're healthcare staff, physical therapy, occupation. Like we want to take care of people. And here we have a disease that has been kicking our butt, right, for a year and a half, right? And we're, we're in another round, and this round we are losing badly, right? This round we aren't saving those patients that we saved last year, right? This round patients go in the ICU, they don't come out of the ICU, right? That's what's happening this round across the country, right? And then, again, you're, you're, you're overworked, right? You're likely underpaid, Um and what's happening, especially, you know, first of all, shout out to my nurses, especially my travel nurses, right? Like a lot of my my nursing, the good ones, right, have had to pick up and leave, right? Because they say, hey, where I, you know, been working at for years, they're not paying me that much to deal with all of this. I can go to a different part of the country and make three, four, five times as much. I'm going over there. So now you're having this brain drain that's occurring. So now, right, when you come into the hospital, you don't, again, I, you don't have the most experienced nurses taking care of you half of the time because they're off taking care of people in other parts of the country, right? Like, so again, it's a, it is a battle, right? We understand it's a battle. We understand it's a long battle. Um, but again, it is, it is very tough when you see everything kind of happening around you and, and you know that again, like, what can I do, right? Like that's, that's kind of what's happening pretty much across the board, um, with COVID, but especially now, right? And again, like I said, it's disheartening, right? When the majority of your COVID patients you're taking care of, um, you know, could have taken a vaccine that likely would have decreased their chances from you even seeing them, right? So think about that, right? Like I, I, I've talked about this before when we talk about hypertension, diabetes, right? If someone could have got to you and just gave you a medication, like, hey, take this blood pressure pill, 
you're not going to have a stroke in 10 years. Take this diabetic medication. I'm not going to have to talk about dialysis in five years, right? Like, like we, we think like it was an issue of someone not being there to educate, right? But what happens if someone was there to educate and you totally disregard it, right? How should the healthcare professionals uh, you know, feel about you? How should our front kind, frontline workers feel about you, right? They're not going to feel great about you, right? They're not going to feel great about, you know, going to work. They're not going to feel like, and again, and this is on top of the fact that they also have to take care of other sick patients, the strokes, the heart attacks, the, the infections, like every, that's non-COVID. Like those are still coming to the hospital. Um, but again, a lot of them, again, because the ERs are full, the hospitals are full, again, you know, everyone's playing double time, right? So again, I thought I thought that was a, a very salient point um, when she noted that, again, healthcare workers are frustrated of what's going on right now. Um, really, and that's this is kind of true across the country. With no end in sight, some nurses at this hospital have even walked off in the middle of their shifts. It's really hard to come to work all the time and just see such sick, young patients who are on every single resource that we can throw at them to keep them alive. You know, at this point, I'm kind of like, it is what it is. Are you worried about the next few weeks if cases continue to rise like this? Yeah, we don't have enough staff for it to get worse. It's just kind of like you're hitting a wall. Do you plan to get the vaccine after you? And and that's what, again, that's what I kind of alluded to, right? We are having, and I, again, I don't envy the jobs of the C-suites across the world, right? Who have to deal with this real life problem happening as we speak, that your healthcare workers are frustrated, they're tired, they're dejected, and and they're looking for an exit. Right. You have a lot of healthcare workers looking for an exit away from what's happening. And what's happened again, what's going to occur is that, again, you're going to get less experienced care when you do have to come to the hospital. Right. You're going to get less experienced care when you are you know, sick with other things outside of COVID. Right. Like and that's what COVID is doing. Right. COVID is not only breaking the system as far as, you know, just hospital overload is breaking the mental will of a lot of healthcare workers across the country. You get out of here? Not at this time. I've read all the bad stuff on it. I've not read any of the good because I didn't believe it. So I have to change my thinking and study. But don't you think that maybe being vaccinated could have prevented you from being here in the first place? Not at this time. I don't believe that. So imagine again, like, it, again, it's, it, it's almost, it's maddening to think that even though she's requiring high flow nasal cannula because of COVID's kicking her butt, and I can tell you just based off what's likely going to occur for a hospital course, if she's able to be weaned off said oxygen, um, she's likely going to be going home with oxygen. So this is a person who did not require any oxygen before she walked into the hospital, but is going to require oxygen for at least a good amount of time when she leaves and still, right, her mind won't allow her to believe that the vaccine could have prevented this, right? Because then she has to admit, right, that she made a mistake. And that's what we're seeing across the board. When I, the patients I was, again, the ones who were not intubated, the ones who are able to talk to, when I would ask them, uh, a lot of their denial was rooted in the fact that if they had to admit that just taking that vaccine, just social distancing, just wearing the mask, just doing all those things that we kind of recommended, would have prevented from being here, right? Then they were in the wrong. And they don't, they, right now, as you can see, um, even when you're in quicksand, you're not gonna admit that you got lost. How are we gonna get out of this if more people don't get vaccinated? I can't answer that. And just just a highlight. Um, I know they they talked about it a little bit this position that you see here when patients are prone, aka laying on their stomach. Um, this is what we do when just laying on your back is not getting you enough oxygen. So this patient here, if you as you can notice, he is already intubated, right? He's not talking. He's already intubated, and even though he's intubated with a machine breathing for him, it wasn't enough to get oxygen in his system. So we had to flip 
patient. And then we do this all the time. We have to flip patients around to do so. And in doing so, what occurs, right? Again, because like I said, I take care of, I have probably taken care of uh, over this pandemic, 500 to a thousand or so. It's probably higher, but like, I'm just kind of estimating in that range, right? Um, of patients with COVID. And then what occurs is when you're laying face down for hours at a time, which they typically are usually about 12, 24, depending on it, um, you get a lot of like wounds, face mask and intubation. You get a lot of wounds across the face uh, that occur just because of pressure ulcers, right? Things again, things that, you know, the other side, right, you know, will continue to downplay. I'm not sure why, but they continue to downplay. That's where we talk about disinformation, right? Again, you have this lady here. She said, I was watching TV. I was reading. I was reading the wrong stuff, right? I was I was getting misinformation that led me to a conclusion that was incorrect. But when you have people at the top, the people who are producing the content, purposely producing the content, so you don't go get vaccinated, you don't wear your mask, you don't social distance, boom, you end up like this guy right here, right? And again, like I said, for patients, again, I don't I don't know his health clinical status, but a lot of patients who end up like this. Don't leave the hospital. All right, and that's uh, all right, perfect. That's that's it there. All right, yeah. So again, like I said, it was again. I I've, I wanted to definitely highlight that video, but just really just kind of highlight really the theme and crux of why. You know, we're doing what we're doing, especially at least with me, Dr. Barry. And then really, again, especially if you follow any other doctor, most doctors are doing this as well. Why we're trying to step up now, right, to combat this information, right? And like I've said before, I said this beginning, like, again, we're a little behind, right? We're a little behind. We're playing catch up, but that's okay, right? We'll continue to play catch up. Like I said, we'll continue to do lives and podcast episodes and videos, anything we could do to get the correct message out there. Um, Cause it's needed, right? Like it's, again, we are in trouble right now, right? COVID is, you know, running circles and this, and it makes it worse. Like I said, it makes it worse now because we have viable treatments, right? And we're still getting our butt kicked, even though we have a viable treatment that is, is out to the public and it's free, right? I could imagine, right? For example, my diabetic patients, right? I have sympathy for my diabetic patients because sometimes to get their insulin, it costs them the, the same amount in their mortgage, right? To, to, it, they have to choose whether I eat or I get my insulin, whether I feed my kids or I get my insulin. My COPD patients, right? My asthma patients, their, their inhaler medication may cost them three, two, three, four hundred bucks, right? A month, right? They have to decide whether I eat or whether I get my medication, right? So I understand when they end up in the hospital. I'm not going to understand, and I, it's difficult for me to empathize for people who you go to Publix, Walmart, Walgreens, all these other places, and we're begging people to get this medication for free, and people aren't taking it because of the misinformation that's been given to them, right? Like, and that's what you're seeing from a lot of healthcare professionals, right? A lot of healthcare professionals are walking to ICUs, right? Because again, imagine, right? When I when I go to take care of your family in the ICU. I'm not taking care of them from like, I got to like, I'm, I'm all in their face, right? So I run the risk of picking up COVID myself or bringing COVID, giving it to my family, right? Like I'm running that risk for a person who decided that I don't believe that COVID-19 is a real thing. I don't believe the vaccine works, right? So now I, the physician, the healthcare worker, the nurse, the occupational therapist, the physical therapist, uh, the all of our amazing specialists, ID, nephrology, uh, pulmonology, everybody, right? Like GI, like everybody is like hands on deck, but they're having to put, you know, again, their life on the line, you know, is what it is, right? They're putting their life on the line for someone who did not believe that this was even true to, be to begin with, right? So again, and, and, and again, like I said, they're likely overworked, right? They're likely underpaid, right? So again, so now a lot of people are thinking like, all right, how do I get out of here? Right. Like how what how do I make my exit up out of this healthcare system, especially if these are the type of patients I have to take care of? Right. You know, it just is that's that's just kind of the crazy, you know, aspect that we're at right now. Um, I know it's gonna get better when I'm not sure. Uh, but I can tell you right now, COVID-19 is really kicking our butt and um I hope things can change uh for the better. Right. So again, I am here truly, Dr. Barry Pierre, board certified internist 
host of Medicine Mondays, host of Real Physician Reacts. Follow me on my Instagram page. Uh, follow me on Twitter, Facebook. Um, you know, again, shoot. If you got, you know, if you liked what you see today, hit in the comments. If there's a video um, that you, you want me to talk about, uh, catch me on Instagram or Facebook. Shoot me a DM. Say, hey, can you talk about this? And we'll make sure. And again, I'll, and obviously I'll give you a shout out if we uh, choose your video. Right. You guys be blessed. Have a great night. Stay safe. Right. If you're not vaccinated. Right. Wear your mask. Social distance. Get vaccinated. Um, and if you are vaccinated, especially because of the way the Delta variants playing games, wear your mask. Social distance as much as you can, man. You guys be blessed. I'm going to see you guys. See you guys next Monday for Medicine Mondays.